Thanks for watching a message today. My name is Caleb Combs. I'm the gathering pastor here at the river, and we would love to connect with you. An easy way to do that is text River Connect, no space, to 97000. Or you can visit our website for more information. If you'd like to support the River Church financially, you can text an amount to 84321, or again, visit our website, theriverchurch.cc, and click the giving tab. We hope you enjoy and are challenged by the message today. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? It's good. AC's on, hopefully, at your home, right? You're like, it's a crazy world, but we're good. It's good to be here. I missed you last week. Uh, my family and I were uh, down at the metropolis of Cincinnati for the weekend. Uh, so we uh, visited a friend, visited the Ark. If you never had an opportunity to go to the Ark, uh, they do a great job with the Ark, presenting the gospel as well as uh, just exactly how Noah built it. And it's amazing, but I uh, had an opportunity to do that and just get away, get a little rest. And But I'm uh, ready to be back with you this morning, if that's okay, all right? I, uh, uh, I told Noble actually before the night, I said, this sermon could be 35 to 55 minutes. I'm not sure. We'll, we'll see how it goes, but I'm uh, excited. Um, uh, anytime I get a break, it almost come, I come back a little like, man, that first sermon, I think if you tracked it, is a little longer, uh, a little more energetic and a little more passionate, but just means that I missed you and it's great to be uh, back this morning. I, I told Noble, I said, I, I, man, I feel like I don't want to miss a, a, a Second Corinthians sermon. Hey, I feel like you're missing uh, some great uh, nuggets in the book. We, if you're new today, if you're a guest with us or you haven't been following along, we're in the book of Second Corinthians as a church. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 4 this morning. But it, it, it's, there's so many incredible truths and hopefully you're following along, reading along with us. Uh, you get extra bonus points and extra credit if you read along with us. I don't know what those mean, but uh, it sounds good to say. Uh, but we are uh, reading through the book together. A uh, little homework precursor. You ready? We're going to read through chapter 4, six verses today. But then the next couple weeks we'll, we'll finish chapter 4 so you can read along. There's 18 verses. Uh, and I think for most of us we probably could read it. Um, every single day and it'll jump out and something new will come out. If you've read any of the Bible at any time, you can read a passage uh, and it's amazing. You read it one time or a hundred times and then that a hundred and first time something else will pop out and jump out. You're like, wow, I've never saw it or understood it that way. And it's amazing how God's word is living and active and God speaks through it in ways that we need and directs us and guides us and leads us. And it's amazing. And if you miss everything else this morning, understand this is God's word and he speaks to us through it and we can hear it and understand it. And it's great to be able to be a part of. Um, and I'm glad that he gave us a book that we can understand because I don't know about you, um, I need it over and over and over and over again because I'm hard-headed, uh, much like a couple of you. Not everybody, but just a couple of you, right? But I, I believe um, chapter 4 is a bit of a, a not a U-turn, not, a, U not a, a direction change in the letter, but it is a, um, a veer-off, if that makes any sense. Chapter 4, Paul begins to make some, uh, some statements, not different statements that he's made through the first three chapters. The first three chapters are almost like a, a defense in exactly what's happening and going on in his life in the church of Corinth. So he's, he's dealing with some emotional responses. He's dealing with some direct accusations that, hey, you're dealing with a hardship, so you can't be of God. And he's really trying to validate his calling and validate his ministry. But in chapter 4, he begins to talk about the call to ministry. He begins to talk about his call to ministry, the substance of his ministry, the purpose of his ministry, and really um, exactly why he does what he does. If you're sitting here today, uh, I do want you to know this. You're sitting here watching online, hearing at another time, you as a believer... You, as a follower of Christ, are called to ministry. You're like, really? What does that mean? 
Am I called to get up and preach? No, no, no. Some people are called to preach. Some people are called to teach. Some people are called to uh, different giftings. And that's okay. But every single person is called to a ministry. May not be full-time vocational ministry. Uh, I have a privilege of being able to do what I do and get paid to do it. But I'll tell you this. If I didn't get a paycheck on Friday, you'd see me here son next Sunday to preach the gospel. Why? Because it's the calling of God in my life. And it's important that every single person sees that and understands that we have been called into ministry. Some ministries look like, hey, you know what, I, I, I serve in the nursery. Some people just greet. Some people um, write cards. Some people love and, and encourage. Some people um, work at our recovery. I mean, you can do ministry after ministry after ministry. The ministry doesn't actually have to be a part of the River Church. Maybe you have a ministry with neighbors that you care and love and you lead a Bible study. You're like, this is a ministry that I have. Others of you do the ministry of loving and encouraging middle schoolers. God bless you and keep you uh, and protect you, right? If you're a middle schooler sitting here, I love you. I do want you to know that. But it's, there's different ministries, and ministries are hard and difficult, but every single one of us is called to them. But that ministry word is a bit of a church word. You're like, ministry, well, what does that mean? You ready? Simple terms, the work of God. I have been called to the work of God, to live out, to live out and represent the work of God in my life, in my marriage, in my every single day. I have been called to do this. Not perfect, but it's a striving goal of my life. It's interesting, chapter 3, Paul calls us ministers of the new covenant, that we carry the gospel, that we spread the gospel, that we preach the gospel, that we represent Jesus because he is the gospel, the good news. Jesus is that and we have been called as followers of Christ, as children to be that representation. The Bible calls us ambassadors of Christ. I don't know about you, every time I hear that, that scares me. Because I'm like, man, I, I, I too many times don't represent Christ the way I should. But we have been called as ambassadors, representation of his work and really of him. That's where the word Christian came from. Christ or little followers of Christ. That's what Christians mean. And so we have been called to represent him. Matthew chapter 28, if you've been a part of any of our gatherings, hopefully you've heard this, but it's an action call to ministry. Go to all the world and preach the gospel. You're like, well, I don't necessarily have to preach. That's not necessarily preaching from a stage. That's representing Christ in the work of God. So go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And so God has called us into an action, a response. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul's writing again to the church of Ephesus. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk, there's that action, right? In a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one, with one another in love eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. There's that call again. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The last one is Romans 12.1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Another translation says your reasonable act or your reasonable service. It's just what you have been called to. There's verse after verse after verse in the Bible where we can point out you as a follower of Christ, me as a follower of Christ, where we have been called to the work of God. You're like, man, I, I don't know if I agree with that. Well, you know what? Don't argue with me. Argue with God's words. Right? 
It's an understanding that we must take up. Some of us are gifted with different abilities. Some of us are gifted with different strengths. That's why I love the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where he talks about the body, each part playing its part where, you know what? Put together we become the work and we become more effective for the work of the ministry. Coming together, realizing that people over here have different giftings than people over there. Those that are watching online, we all have different giftings and then brought together perform and live out the work of the ministry. And that is what God has called us to. Whether you embrace that call, fight that call, that's between you and God. But my goal as a pastor is to preach the truth and to reveal the word of God to you to say, hey, you know what? This is what God has called us. Some of you are sitting there thinking, well, you know what? They must be short on volunteers. I was thinking this morning, I'm like, man, I should have saved this sermon, preach it in August when we're recruiting for volunteers for fall ministry. But I guarantee you can help out at VBS if you want. Sign up at guest services, right? <laughs> no, this is not anything to do with like, a, hey, you can be a part of this and tie this. No, no, no. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the call and the purpose. And really, Paul walks through exactly why his call to ministry is important to him and exactly what it should look like. If you have your Bibles, flip to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, read along, you're on a device, flip to it, slide to it. I don't know if you can flip to a, something on your phone, but you know what I mean, right? Read along with us, it'll be on the screen. Verse 1 says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. It, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of God, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not of ourselves. Man, that's one of my favorite parts of the whole passage. What we proclaim is not of ourselves. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. But Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me this morning? God, we ask you to speak. We come to you in worship. We come to you in praise. God, we need you. We need you to speak. God, thank you for your calling. God, thank you for your calling to every single person that can hear my voice. God, we know you've called us to be used. God, may we pick up that mantle, pick up that cross. God, may you challenge us, convict us, guide us, direct us this morning. Speak, we need you. We love you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. In these six verses, Paul walks through some, some different structures or different purposes of why he does what he does. And I'm, I'm grateful for it. In verse 1, he begins by saying, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. See, in serving in ministry, it's easy to lose heart. So Paul points out, hey, if you are called to ministry, if you are serving in ministry, you must do it with passion and perseverance. Serving with passion and perseverance. Man, I want you to know this and understand this. The reason why you serve, the reason why we serve is because God deserves the best we have and all of our effort. God loves us. He sent his only son, Jesus, in our acts of worship. We praise him. Paul points it out and says, I have this ministry by the mercy of God. 
God's mercy is great. Ephesians 2, but God, if you're, in, if you're ever reading your Bible and, and that but God pops out, you may want to highlight it, underline it, because following it is going to be a big, huge statement. And, and following it is, this one is the same. But God, verse 4 of chapter 2 of Ephesians, being rich in mercy, being God is full of mercy. God is the, 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 the picture, the full embodiment of mercy. Because of the great love which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses. Made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You need to see this and understand that. And embracing the ministry call is realizing what God has done for me. What God has done in his great mercy because of what you've done. Wow, God, I didn't deserve it. I was broken. I was lost. I was headed to hell and I didn't deserve anything. Yet God, in your rich mercy, in your rich grace, in your abundant grace, you love me. You picked me out of my brokenness, cleaned me off, put my feet on a solid rock and called me to ministry. That's the, that's the realization that my passion comes from. You're like, man, Caleb, you, you get really into your messages. Yeah, it's just only the realizing that I don't deserve to stand here. I don't deserve to serve God. I don't find myself going, well, God, I'm a first-round draft pick. Uh, you, you're lucky to have me on your team. I got other offers. Right? That's what we do, though. We almost find ourselves going, you know what, God? Well, you know what? I, you want to talk to my agent. We'll, we'll figure something out. You want to give me a signing bonus. No, no, no. The realization of I brought nothing to the table. I bring nothing to the table. Yet, God, you love me in your rich mercy. You loved me and sent your only son so that I can have life. That is the creation of passion in my heart. It should be the creation of passion in our serving of God to realize, wow, God, you loved me. You saved me. Now I will do anything for you. It's not in a way that says, God, I'm going to earn it. No, 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 no. I don't serve to earn my salvation. I serve because of what God has done already in my life. That's the call to ministry. It's a passion that builds. Because once you fully realize what God has done in your life, you cannot help but be passionate. Yeah, it comes out of some others differently, and that's okay. Some in excitement, some in tears. But it's a heaviness, a weight in your heart to realizing, wow, God, I owe you everything. You paid my debts. That's why I love Paul saying, having this ministry, having the calling by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. There's that, that perseverance. Where's that perseverance looks like? Ministry is hard. Not, not, not pastoral ministry. I'm saying serving is difficult. Some of you sitting here go, man, I've been hurt by a pastor. I've been hurt by a youth pastor. I've been hurt by some people that I was trying to serve, and I'll never do it again. Well, you weren't serving them. You're serving God. Don't lose heart. Well, Kayla, I, you, don't, you don't even understand. I, I drew a scenario. At nine, I said, you know, you, you're like, man, I, I've been called. I, I feel like God wants me to work with teenagers. Lord bless you, right? You, you go back to guest services. You sign up. I want to I help with teenagers. Sign up. Youth pastor calls you. And he says, hey, you know what? We're going to get you involved. It comes, you know, comes out. You walk in. And you feel like you're working with aliens. <laughs> They're looking at you like you're 150 years old. And you're looking at them like I have nothing in common with these people. None, none of them talk to you. Oh, you have one person come up to you and say, ask you a question and some sort of technology thing that you have no idea what you're talking about. You're like, that's a real thing? I thought that was something from the Jetsons. 
And then you go get in your car afterwards. You're like, wow, those things happen? Yeah, yeah, they do. I've watched it happen to people. And what happens? They never come back. They never serve again. You're like, really? Yeah. They felt called. I was called by God. I, I knew it. I knew I should help. I knew I should work with teenagers. I don't understand them. I don't like them. They bother me. I don't know what's going on with the next generation. It's crazy. But you know what? I, God wants me to help them and love them and care for them. And so I'm going to do it. And then nobody talked to me. And so it was too hard and difficult. So I left. And I'll sit in my seat on a Sunday morning. But that's, that's enough. You're like, are you just picking on that ministry? No, no, no. You can fill in the ministry blank. Ministry is hard. It's difficult. Some of you have been disappointed by it. You don't think Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 had been disappointed by ministry? The weights, the hurts, the battles, the pains, the difficulties, the defeats. He found himself at a place going, man, I have this by the mercy of God. God has called me. And, and guess what? I will not lose heart because of the passion God has given me. So you must realize your passion so that you can persevere. So if you don't have passion for what God has done in your life, you'll never persevere. You'll find yourself going, why am I doing this? Why am I putting myself through these hard times? Why am I going up to camp and sleeping on these, these terrible beds to love kids and it hurts and it's, it's terrible? You find yourself going, wow, God will do anything for you. I'll give it all for you. Because you gave it all for me. My passion comes from realizing what God has done in and through me. First Timothy, Paul even says I was a persecutor, blasphemer, enemy of God. But I received mercy. So we've been called to persevere with passion. But in verse 2, Paul talks about um, another concept of serving. He talks about this ministry look and serving with purity. 2 Corinthians verse 2. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. Here Paul is addressing some sort of specific charge that the false teachers that had come in behind him, they had begun to, to uh, cut him down. They began to undermine his ministry. And so he is addressing something. Most theologians begin to, to read this and understand it, that they came uh, behind Paul and they began to say his gospel wasn't true. They began to say it was watered down and they began to say, you know what, man, uh, Nobody can be that effective for the ministry. Um, he must be doing something. He must be cheating. He must be changing the words. And Paul is saying, hey, you know what? My ministry is pure. We've renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. So that underhanded way is talking about trickery. Disgraceful, used for self-benefit. That word cunning is, is, is really specific. You ready? It's used a couple other times in the Bible in description of Satan. Isn't that crazy? And so it's, it, it's, it's a scri describing, you know what? We have not misaligned. We've not changed the word of God. We've not allowed Satan to come in and, and change the words, change the gospel, change our priorities. We have stayed steady to the work of God and to the word of God. Paul points here towards the purity of his work in defense saying, you know what? You know what? The word of God is enough. You see, this morning, if, if I, 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 I don't do anything other than challenge you to dive into God's word more and more each day, then I've accomplished everything my goal should be. You're like, really? Yeah, because you being in your Bible for 40 minutes a week is not enough. I want you to, 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 to see this and understand this and go, wow, how can we as a church, how can we as individuals, how can we as families, how can we as couples be in God's word even more so that it translates and it challenges us to be a part of the work in the ministry of God. 
See, the purity of the ministry only comes through the realizing that God's word is pure. It's perfect. There are no errors. It's valuing it. But sadly, in our culture, the watering down, the changing of God's word, I know I don't need to talk about specifics, but man, there's things that churches are going to have to make stands on. There's things that if the Bible says that it's true, no matter what culture or the news or social media or Facebook says, you know what, if God's word says it, it's true. That's not meant to bash you over the head. That's actually said with love and compassion. Saying, you know what, we trust God's words and we lean on it. It's all that we have. Realizing that the purity of it is important. But making it a part of what we do is so valuable. So our call to ministry must be with passion and perseverance, but also be with purity. Paul tells his uh, greatest follower, Timothy, one who is trained, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, approved workman, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, handling God's words. Right now, churches... Religious institutions are using the Bible for self-gain. Taking Bible verses out of context or using it as a religious hobby horse to say, you know what, this is what God's word says, when in reality it's not. That's not me kicking anybody specific. That's me challenging us as a church. Hear this important. Challenging us to be in God's word as a ministry, to be a part of that. The next few verses of chapter 4, Paul continues. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not of ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. You see, in ministry, you must realize that you have to be a part of serving with passion and perseverance, but also purity, but also, watch this, with praise and position. You're like, what does that mean? First realizing that my praise, my ministry is built on Christ. It's not about me. When I serve God, it's about praising Jesus because he's worthy of it. Every single effort and time. I don't get up and preach so that you can pat me on the back. I get up and preach so that I can praise Jesus. Hopefully everywhere where you serve ministry, everywhere where you give effort is not so people can see you and go, wow, they're, 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 they're really gifted. They have those abilities. They can sing. They can play this instrument. They can teach. Wow, they can greet. They can co-. You fill in the blank of where you're serving in your ministry. is not so that others can see you. It is simply based on praising God. Building that praise, worshiping him, glorifying him. For some reason, in our world, this concept of Christian narcissism has made its way. You're like, that's an oxymoron. It is. But it's it's made its way into churches where it's become about me. It's become about us. It's become about what we want. It's become about what we desire You see, the term Christian is worshiping and elevating Christ. Narcissism should take a back seat. It's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about worship of self. It's laying myself aside. It's dying to self daily and realizing, God, I worship you. You're worthy of my praise. See, praise and position is tied with when I realize my position. Like, what does that mean? 
See, my position is realizing as I'm not on the same playing field as God. Not close. I'm broken. He's pure. He's light. I was dark. He's life. I was death. Yet God loved me. And so I find myself realizing my position is to praise him. My position is to worship him. My position is to praise him in my ministry. Not just the ministry you see, the ministry of loving my wife, the ministry of raising my kids, the ministry of loving my neighbor, the ministry of doing all that God has called me to do, the work of God. The work of God is going, God, I praise you in it and through it. I don't want any praise. You see, we don't gather so we can be somebody. We don't get up and preach so that the world can go, wow, they, they've got it all together. We don't gather on a Sunday morning so we can say, we've got this many people. No, 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 no. All those things are overrated. Let's throw those things out the window. They bring zero value to the church. The one thing that brings value to the church is praising Jesus. And we're singing and giving and loving and caring. It's finding ourselves as realizing that position. Psalm 100 says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Man, we could just preach that. I could just repeat that for the next eight minutes and we could be done, right? Is that good? Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. That's if you got a good voice or you don't, just so you know. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. See, the psalm after psalm, verse after verse, realizing our call to ministry, realizing our call to praise the name of Jesus, realizing my position is simply saying, God, I lift you up. God, I elevate you. God, I worship you. And guess what? I'm good with it. That's where we ought to be as a church. That's where we must be as, as individuals, as families, and our call to ministry. See, worship isn't about me. Oh, that person sang good. They gave good. They, no. My true worship is praising Jesus. Last thing will get you out of here this morning. Verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the last thing Paul talks about in ministry is purpose. Know your purpose. Know your purpose. Yeah, it's easy to be passionate. Yeah, man, God has done great things. It's not real easy to be pure, but it's a call that we're to be wholly set apart. Man, it's hard to persevere at times. Man, I could praise him because, man, I praise him with everything I have. Realizing the purpose. Let light shine out of darkness. Has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. There's why. There's why, church. There's why we serve. There's why we give. There's why we love. And so that others can see and glorify God. They can see us and say, wow, there's light there. The world we live in is dark. The world we live in is broken. The world we, we endure is headed to hell. But realizing that God in his great mercy gave light. Jesus is the light of the world. And guess what he's called us to be as believers the ministry of God, you ready? The light, city on a hill. Salt and light. 
So that others can say, wow, glorify God. They can see your actions and glorify God. When I was a kid, I uh, uh, was in, some of you remember these, some of you are horrified to hear this. Some of, I was in some uh, children's plays. We used to do plays down at uh, Faith when I was a kid. We used to do them every year. It's lots of fun. If you want some VHS tapes, it'd be fun to watch. Probably not. I remember one year, uh, Mark and Debbie Kerr, who attend here, they said, hey, we're going we're gonna to do a play. We want you to be the herald part. I'm like, what is that? What a herald? What are you, what are you talking about? So the play, I, my, my part was to be a herald uh, where I'd come in and present the king or the pharaoh every time. And so I just played that part and I would, I would scream. And I know you're surprised my voice was uh, loud and squeakier then than it is now. Uh, but it, it was the way it works. So I'd come in every, every part the king or the pharaoh would come in. And I would present them. You're like, well, why do you tell that? One, so you can be proud that I was in some place, just so you know. But two, let's really talk about what a herald is. So when a herald comes in, they present that the king is coming. That the king is coming. Church, you sit here today as a herald. I preach today as a herald. You're like, well, what do you mean? The king is coming. The king of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe, he's coming. We as children, representation of light, have a purpose to spread and cast that light to the dark, broken world so that others can say, wow, I saw the light through you. May we be heralds to the broken world. May we be heralds to the lost. May we be beacons to the broken. May they see the church really standing out, not for self-gain, not for self-purpose, not to say we've done anything. That's all overrated. So that we can point to Jesus. May we be heralds for him. What's interesting, and the last thing I get you out of here. I told you it could be longer or not. I, I apologized. I apologized early. <laughs> What's interesting in this passage, these six verses. There's no call to results. Like, what do you mean? There's never like, hey, you've done so much, you've accomplished this. There's never a point in this that says, hey, you know what? Your call is to make sure these thousands and thousands of people, or uh, you know what? Pat on the back. This, this is not in there. The call is to be faithful. I, <laughs> I don't know how to even say this, so I'm just going to say it. I, uh, I'm a results-driven person. You know me at all, man, finish line, I love results. Finish line, weight loss, wh whatever you want to do. You want to compete, I, I just, we see the results and, and, and I'll, I'll do whatever I can to have the results. You're like, really? Is that you? I'm sorry, I'm just being honest with you this morning. I didn't tell many people this. That's <laughs> terrible to even admit, but. I first began preaching a few years ago. The results weren't there. Not that they're there now. I'm, I'll get there. But results were, man, man, people were leaving. I'm like, well, I, I sat down with some of my closest friends. I said, I believe God called me here. I believe God has placed me here. But, man, if the results aren't tied to it, that's cool. I, I need to go. You're like, really? Like, yeah, I, that's, that's my, that was my mindset. I, my wife can tell you, and it was, it's not a good mindset. But once we begin to tie the results to our calling, that's when we come off kilter. That's when we come wrong. See, God has just called us to be, embrace the calling and be faithful in it. Embrace the calling and God will do the work. What's great about this passage, he said, some will listen, some will be blinded by the darkness of this world. But guess what? 
Your calling is to, guess what? Be faithful. Be faithful to it. Be faithful to your calling when it's hard, when no one's noticing, when the results don't make sense, when you don't think you can do it anymore. Be faithful in your calling. God will bless that. You see, our calling is not based on when and how it happens. Our calling is based on what God has done in us. That's the purpose, that's the calling in our lives. It's important that we understand that, embrace that, grasp that. I'm grateful for these six verses. I don't know if you can see this, but I've highlighted them in my Bible. I highlighted them in my Bible because I need to read them over and over again. Verse 5, just, for what we proclaim is not of ourselves, but Jesus Christ. Wow. Oh, man. There's safety in that. There's strength in that. There's comfort in that. There's refuge in that. You're calling your ministry. It's not about you. You're not serving a pastor. You're not serving a church. You're not doing it so somebody can pat you on the back. You're doing it because Jesus called you to do it. May we do that. May we embrace that. May we proclaim him. Can I pray for you this morning? God, we come to you. God, I'm so sorry that I fight your calling. God, I'm so sorry that I don't embrace it at times. God, may all that I do, may all that we do praise you. May we not lose heart, may we persevere. When the results don't seem to make sense, May we praise you. The mountaintops and the valleys, God, may we praise you. When we feel the purpose, we don't even see it, but we know the calling is right. May we persevere and praise you. God, may we as a church be that light. May we embrace the call to ministry. May we embrace our giftings that you've gifted each and every person here, sitting here, watching online, listening to it another time. God, I know you have gifted every single person differently, and that's incredible. God, you said you fearfully and wonderfully made us. God, marvelous are your works. God, we praise you. God, we love you. We need you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your words. In Jesus' wonderful name.